All right. Jason, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. How are you, Mike? Pretty good. Just uh, busy as always. Yeah, yeah. It's good to be back for podcast number three. This is uh, the Full Quadrant podcast with Jason and Mike. We uh, actually were meant to drop our third episode out a week ago, but we ran into technical difficulties with the connection over Zoom. So we're re-recording. Hopefully it's for the better. I would expect it is. I think we have some some good ideas of things that we can add to the conversation that we recorded last time. So to get the juices flowing and, and kind of get us in our groove here, I want to ask you, Mike. Um, so I think the conversation that we recorded last week, we were talking about Napopo. Um, Napopo is very much um, a modern dog training system. Tell me, tell me something outrageous for, for better or for worse that people say or comment about modern methods of dog training like why is why is modern dog training such a such a topic amongst the tribes in in the dog industry one reason is because a lot of people don't want to talk about punishment right or pressure using any kind of pressure with dog training they they think that if you just reinforce a separate behavior more than the one that the dog is doing right that they'll um they'll do that more, right? They'll stop. The, the other one, what they say is it'll go extinct, you know, but it doesn't go extinct. It's always there. It's dormant, you know, not extinct. About, yeah. Exactly. What we know about the extinction burst or, you know, the extinction curve, mm -mm. if it looks like extinct, but if, if for any reason it's reinforced at any time, then it pops back up. Right. And sometimes it'll be stronger because now it's on a long term reinforcement schedule or intermittent reinforcement schedule. Right. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> that's, I, I saw that um, today actually on Facebook because they're like, just reinforce another behavior and the other one will go extinct. And uh, the way I, I like to tell people is the option is still there. Right. Multiple choice. Right. You, behavior A or do behavior B, which the people say has gone extinct. The option is still there. The dog can still decide to do it because it has not been uh, punished away, right? When you punish a behavior, it removes that option for the dog. It tells the dog, this is not an option anymore, right? Choose something else. You can reinforce another behavior, but the punishment causes that behavior to say, like, it's off the table. Right. It's extinct versus dormant is quite different, right? Dormant is still alive and well, right? It's like a hibernating bear, you know, if, if you poke the bear and he wakes up or, or enough time passes and the, the, the scientific term is spontaneous recovery, right? An extinction burst, right? The behavior that was once punished away reappears spontaneously again, spontaneous recovery. And now you've got a, you've got that beast to deal with again. Um, so yeah, I think you're right. Punishment, punishment's a hard thing to talk about because they, they equate the emotion, the sentimental component with the word punishment. People interpret punishment as like, oh, it's, it's, um, you know, revenge. It's, 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 there's, um, you know, a negative connotation with, with the word punishment, but punishment is just the subtraction of the likelihood of behavior continues to happen again in the future. What's an outrageous statement about Napopo? <clears throat> an outrageous statement about Napopo. One thing I hear, I don't know about being outrageous, but uh, one thing I hear is people say, oh, I do that, right? What is it? Just <laughs> pressure and then reward after. Uh-huh. Pressure on, pressure off. Right? And then reward, right? And people go, oh, we, I do that. You know, but it's, <laughs> it's not, I mean... That's the definition of Napopo, right? Negative, positive, positive. But it's not as simple as just you put pressure on, you relieve the pressure, and then you add a reward, you know, afterward. So it's not that simple. You know, it's much more in depth. It's about everything from the, you know, positive, I mean, uh, classical conditioning, operant conditioning. Right, the, talking about the quadrants, talking about how they work, why to use them, when to use them, how classical conditioning works, right? How 
uh, reinforcement works, how punishment works, how correction is different than aversive stim, right, in Napo Po. It's like, it, it's, it's caused me, like, getting into Napo Po has caused me to look at all my interactions and say, like, how is that affecting my dog? And how is that affect, you know, if we talk about people, it's again, how is that, what am I, what I'm doing is how, how is that affecting the person I'm dealing with right now? Yeah. Right. And watching the behavior, that's the, the biggest thing for me as far as uh, looking at everything through the Naples lens. So I want to talk to you real quick as we're kind of warming up here about modern dog training is like something I think is kind of outrageous is modern dog training isn't all that modern, right? What's modern about modern dog training are the labels and the definitions we've applied to techniques that have been used for a long time, right? Things that we arrived at and we arrived at those definitions through the, you know, like the, the thirties to the sixties, the, 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 the behavioral scientific research that took place from the thirties to the sixties, um, on the pigeons, the rats, you know, even behavioral psychology dealing with like infants, you know, and, and things like that. What it is, is that in the past, a lot of times the, that <laughs> science has been nitpicked, right? Like they've cherry picked, they've yeah. taken bits and pieces and used it, but not taken everything. That makes sense. Yeah. And I think what modern dog training is that taking everything, putting definitions, like you said, like, so people can understand it now and using it in its full capacity. Right. right? Yeah. And I, I think, you know, like the, <laughs> so to speak, the cavemen of the dog training industry who, who use like, you know, I, I was watching a comment or a thread on a video. I think it was a video involved with Bart doing some training at, uh, with a Frisbee and uh, using like using some activation um, with a with a Frisbee. Someone commented that, oh, this is something this is nothing new. I've been doing this for for 20, 30 years now. But they had a very, very foundational misunderstanding of what was actually going on. And they couldn't, they couldn't call reinforcement, reinforcement. They couldn't call punishment, punishment, and, or, or they had the two mixed up. And that's where, you know, yeah, like modern dog training does utilize a lot of things that have been in existence for a long time because it's, it's, it's just nature. It's natural language. It's natural law, physics, and, and things that speak normally to animals and, and, and organisms in, in nature. But what they fail to understand is that <clears throat> The definitions allow us to use those concepts or those applications and methods at specific times for specific outcomes that are predictable outcomes. The, the, the definitions allow us to predict the outcome that we will, we should arrive at. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> the definitions and the way, like you said, the way they're used, I think that's one of the biggest things that also I got from Bart, right? Is when he says a, a knife that cuts both ways. Mm, yeah. Whatever you do, you can't look at it at one thing. You know, so reinforcing a behavior is not necessarily um, working the way you want it all the time. Yeah, it's another, another Bartism is, you know, when is a slap a slap, right? You know, you're in a football game, the Super Bowl, right? You're in your Las Vegas Super Bowl suite right now watching, you know, uh, full quadrant podcast and uh you know you see these guys just kidding you run out onto the field and everyone's like smacking each other hitting each other on the head taking them by the helmets and going gosh and headbutting it's like you know you do that in any other context and that would be seen as violent but in the in the context of the super bowl it's activation it's maybe a little bit negative negatively reinforcing or motivating even you know maybe it's rewarding <laughs> you, you you spike the ball you get a touchdown you go headbutt your player and you're, yeah you're screaming at each other but again in any other context or any other environment that would be seen as like violent behavior that would be looked down on you know yeah yeah like going back to what i said that's what it's caused me to look at everything 
It's not as just, was that a reward or was that punishment, mm. right? It's caused me to look at the reward, the context of what it's happening in. And then you see that, mm. like I see it all the time, where in one context, something will be punishing, but in the other one, it's not, right? Like, oh, for example, like my dog, he, I've never punished him or given any kind of uh, pressure to keep him from going out the door into my garage, right? But if, if it's a certain context where I'm walking out with him, following him, he stops at the doorway when it's open. It doesn't matter. He just stops right? because he's learned that I'm going to let him know when to go out, right? I've just not let him go out in the past over, I mean, he's six and a half years old now. So just multiple repetitions of having him wait at the door until I go out. And now he just stops when the door's open, right? Bullby does. Yeah. So has he been punished for that? No. Has he learned that he should wait? Yes. And then he even, I've seen him do it when I wasn't even present, right? <laughs> the door is open. He just, he's waiting at the door, waiting for me to say, okay. Yeah. And that's with, you know, with the garage door open, he could run out whenever he wanted, but he just learned. That would have been faster with punishment. Don't know. Yeah. yeah. Most likely, yes. Mm. So, Napopo is it's what we're here to talk about today for this episode. I liked that you brought up that Napopo isn't what people think it is because just because they go through the motions, right? Napopo is determined by the outcome, right? And, and that's something that a lot of people forget. Even even the people who've been practicing for a while is that like the outcome should demonstrate a specific style, a, a specific product, right? <clears throat> and and that's what's so important uh, about the whole thing. So why don't you kick us off? And I mean, the biggest question about Napopo is like, okay, what is what is Napopo? Like the actually the the word itself. So yeah, I think I mentioned it before. Napopo is it's an abbreviation for negative, positive, positive, and for this, it's not about, it's about the meaning of the word, right? Negative being not good and positive being good, right? As defined by the dog, the one who's experiencing it, not not by not being defined by the science of it, because you can equate some of the um, there are some acronyms that connect it to the quadrants, but the actual interpretation of Napopo is actually ne meaning a negative stimulus that doesn't feel good, po being positive. Po being a second positive. Actually, then it's, you say it doesn't feel good, but it's actually mild discomfort. It's what it's um, defined as in Napo Po, right? The nay is mild discomfort. Sure. So, and then going back to what you said, it's up to the dog to decide what is mild discomfort, right? This morning I was playing with uh, Ripley, my Doberman, and same thing, she's got the ball in her mouth. And I'm just like slapping her shoulders with my hand. <laughs> and she's like, her tail's wagging and she's like pushing back into me, right? And it wasn't, they weren't so soft slaps. They're just, I mean, for her, it was play. Yeah. <clears throat> right? If somebody looked at that, they would look at it as something bad. But she's like coming back for more, wagging her tail, her ears are up. And it, it was part of the game, right? So in that context, Definitely. And with her, it's almost any context. Like she, she likes physical contact for me. Right. So that's where the nape, na the negative part is. One, it's mild discomfort, but two, in Naval Po, it's what the dog considers as discomfort, not what we consider as discomfort. Right. Because again, the dog might not even register the level that is being used. Right. And if, if they can't register or, or if they don't experience it, then the relief of that is not going to be a teaching event to the dog. Yeah. Right. But, and also at the same time, it's about being able to take that, even if it is mildly discomfort, uh, uncomfortable mm -hmm. and turning it into a positive for the dog where they, they search for it, right. Yeah. Where it means something to them. It triggers something. It's a cue. Yep. And knowing the, how to use that, right. To your advantage, which is what we want. Yeah. Which, I mean, at the end of the day, 
Napopo, I mean, it becomes about a, it becomes a conversation about training methods that get your dog to always do behavior on cue with heart and soul, right? <clears throat> that's that's boiled down its essence. Yeah, and the key is always also, right? Besides the heart and soul part, always do. Yeah, that's the part where I think people, a lot of people, from pet people to trainers or people. I think they, you see it in competitions where um, people go to competition before their dog is ready. Because they're like, I have to get their, you know, IGP one, I have to get their PSA one, whatever it is, right? And they go before it has become the always. You know, that's one thing, like I remember Bart said, he didn't want to go to competition until he knew his dog was going to do it. Right. And what we do is we go and we're like, oh, I think my dog will do it. It's like, maybe, right? <laughs> maybe. I think he'll do it. Most of the time he does it. But you should, going into competition, and that's where the always comes in, is you should know, like, hey, my dog's going to do it. Yeah. You shouldn't have a question in your mind, right? That should be it. My dog's doing this. When I tell him to sit, he's going to sit. Right. Uh, and that's where, like, Bart says thousands of repetitions, and that's, True, the thousand repetitions, not for the dog to learn something. <clears throat> thousands of repetitions is for the dog to always do it on cue, no matter where you're at, no matter what's going on. Yeah. People forget that. It's, it's hard because people, yeah, I mean, you can arrive at a trained behavior in a classroom environment where the dog is doing pretty much every time reliably in the classroom because the classroom is sterile. There's nothing else but that behavior to be done right but you walk out you walk to a new field you travel to a new country you go trial your dog your dog knows they're not under the under the control that you normally have on them in a learning environment with tools with other types of help club members there to you know spot you for behaviors and now it's now it's the wild west of dogs performance right and that's again i think that's the thing that people who've never trialed a dog, they say, oh, it doesn't take a thousand reps. Well, maybe it doesn't in the classroom, but if you wanna know that your dog's gonna do it predictably with heart and soul, when you tell them to do it with the same flair and stylistic you know, approach to that, that behavior, it, it, it really does, you know? And, yeah. and that's something- and That's why Bart, like, Martin Michael, that's one of the things they say, first of all, is dog training is 95% like environmental exposure, right? The other 5% is the training part. But if your dog is not comfortable being out in public and, or they've never experienced being at a certain spot, right? Then they're not going to listen to what you say. They're not going to do what you say. They're yeah. more interested in what's going on. And, maybe not even interested. They're just like, Hey, what is that? They're curious. That's part of the repetitions, right? Exposing yeah. them to everything as much as possible so that they are you know, good, no matter what you do. Yeah. I, I mean, thinking about the definition of Napopo, I mean, that's a pretty simple one. Another one I heard put out there and um, that I really liked from Michael, you know, she had said, expounded on the definition to include a few more important components of what really matters in the system is that, you know, it's a modern dog training system utilizing positive and negative reinforcement benefits to get a dog to do behavior always on cue with heart and soul, right? So enlightening the audience more specifically that yes, we do use the benefits of negative reinforcement because there are benefits of negative reinforcement. We also combine that with the benefits of positive reinforcement. And that's the that's the the sweet spot that gives you the the dog with the reliable behavior with flashy heart and soul performance. Yeah. And that's a that, that was a good clarification for me because I, I I do like that definition. And then uh that is uh the heart and soul part too is how do you get that, right? How do you get the heart and soul? Which means the dog loves doing what what you're asking it to do right? The cues you're giving it, it's waiting for you. The uh, people have said it and I say it is 
does your dog want to do what you're asking it or are you making your dog do what you're asking right making or, or making or begging right yeah it should be the dog is waiting for you to say sit you say sit and he's like yes i was waiting for you to say that yep you know instead of going into the shitter as bart would say <laughs> you say sit I mean, do you have to pay some people to go to the gym? No, most people pay to go to the gym because it's it, it's the other way around. They enjoy it. It's an activity they like to do. Do you have to pay someone to go to Disneyland? No, hardly. People pay to get into Disneyland. So do you have to pay for behavior that a dog loves to do? No. Like So it's about creating behaviors that the dog thinks are rewarding in and of itself. Yeah. And that's where the strongest behaviors that a dog does are the ones that you could say they come up with themselves or the ones that they do spontaneously, right? Um, and that's why we have those, those definitions um, or examples, I should say, not definitions. And the, the one I love the most is because I think every person that has had a dog and taken it for a walk has experienced this example. Yeah. And it's an example of when you're going on the walk, right? The dog is walking and you're letting it sniff, and all of a sudden it sniffs something and it stops. You know, and like I do, I think most people do, they wait, let the dog sniff a little bit, but now they want to go on their way. And what do they do? They pull the dog. And the dog fights them with everything they have to stay sniffing on that spot. Right. And they pull again and the dog still fights. It's just like it's leaning into the leash. And I think we talked about it the last time, right? Where they're they're like, screw you, I'm staying here. I want to sniff this. Yep. And then what happens is when you do something else where you want the dog to sniff something, like train behavior, find this odor, or you know, in IGB tracking. Now you put a little pressure on the leash. You're like, oh, I didn't want to do this anyway. Yeah, I'm going to go with you. Yeah. And that's Napo Po is capturing that and using that for every behavior. So every behavior is the same. It's like, no, I want to sit. No, I want to down. Yeah. No, I want to follow this track. And it tells you that the dog is capable of being trained. If they can do it themselves, they're capable of that same behavior in another circumstance where you would yep. direct them to yeah. do that. And that's Nate Na Po is copying that and using it for training, right? Copying what the dog does, creating that desire. I think Bart says a, a dog will fight for its own invention, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, when the, let the dog, that's uh, the new Napo Po as opposed to the old Napo Po, which is the dog figures out or is creative and creates behaviors and when it creates the behaviors that's where the heart and soul comes from because it's doing them because it wants to yeah the other funny example and i love seeing this when i was down at your house uh with Khan, is why is it possible that at meal time or when a dog is thirsty and the bowl is empty why is the dog grabbing that bowl and marching it around parading that bowl around for you to see that the bowl is empty Maybe he even brings it to you and sets it in your lap. Um, why can a dog give a perfect hold, a perfect carry, a perfect retrieve, but you know, you're out there, you drop your wallet, maybe you toss a dumbbell if you're playing sports and you say, bring, and the dog looks at you like you just spoke to him in Russian or, you know, or Chinese or something like that. And, you know, now you've, now you've got a deaf dog on your hands, right? A dog who was previously like, you know, you, you say you want to go for a walk. He's like, you know, he's like happy to, but then you say, want to bring me something? He's like, what are you talking about? You know? Um, yeah, it's uh, copying, like you said, copy what the dog wants to do naturally and transfer that into all your training, right? And, but, and how do we do that? Right. One, one more thing that I think of when we're talking about these examples is, and it's a big conversation amongst trainers or dog owners is like, a lot of owners, they want to project onto their dog what their dog should find rewarding. They they want to set the rules for their dog, but who are we to say that 
a dog should find what we think it should find rewarding right like and and motivating a dog you know like some people say oh well like dogs need this type of activity to feel genetically fulfilled well what if the dog in front of you is not genetically fulfilled by that activity yeah and that i have a good example of that right uh, with bullvine i was teaching the dumbbell as a puppy he loved carrying the dumbbell he'd just pick it up like first time we the dumbbell was laying there and he was free he picked up the dumbbell just as a puppy just started running around right but it took me a long time to realize that that was more rewarding than like the ball holding the dumbbell was more rewarding and i didn't realize it until i was um at i was at the se seminar with you in california like oh, yeah. yeah where they were rewarding with uh, a very soft ball like it wasn't even a ball right it's um yeah. i don't know how you describe those it's uh it's soft so it's like it can be squeezed by the dog right so they were rewarding bringing back the dumbbell with that but the dog they wouldn't didn't have the dog release the dumbbell the dog was just taking it with the dumbbell in their mouth and they were able to take this ball you know this soft ball yeah um, the and foam like can in both and i think i saw like Bart and Michael showed that a while back where uh, same thing. I think it was Jack. Jack would keep the dumbbell and then grab the ball, right? And then what it triggered in me was thinking back to Bullvibe because I remember he would, I'd click to give him food or I would give him his uh, release cue to give him the ball and he would not drop the dumbbell. Right, because that was his reward of choice. Yes. And now, I, because of that, and because of looking at all that and watching Bart and Michael, I realized, like, just like you said, just because I think what I'm offering is a reward, in that case with Bullvine, it was probably punishment, right? It's like, because he didn't want to let go of the dumbbell. And that's what Napopo taught me is to to understand the motivation through the eyes of the dog not through my eyes right Tr prior to becoming exposed and, and going and educated in napopo i would say oh i want the dog to take this ball and then i'd spend a lot of time trying to build up play drive when maybe he wanted food or maybe he wanted to just be free and run circles in the yard or something like that once i learned more about the science of motivation and learning how to manipulate the access or or um, the interaction with that motivating item or or activity my my ability as a trainer just skyrocketed at that point but it wasn't until i started to look at motivation through the lens of the dog and not through my own lenses that's when i really started to understand quality training and um applying it through yeah. like Modern dog, modern dog training methods. And that goes um, into like the first thing I heard Bart say pretty much at the, at the first seminar I went to was he started off with why does a dog do anything? Yeah. The ultimate question of all things. Ultimate question. And the name of answer is to better its own situation. And then I didn't until later, that's what Bart like, when they talk about you need to do Napo Po for like three to five years to be proficient, right? It yeah. was, um, it took me a while to start looking at everything as, like you said, how is my dog finding its advantage? Even in what I'm offering it as a reward, yeah. right? Is it finding its advantage? It has to find its advantage to want to repeat doing these behaviors that we're asking it to do you know, or anything at all. And that goes for also, you know, the correctional side of things where we're trying to mitigate behaviors is if the thing that we're using for reward is not valuable enough to work for, it's also not valuable enough to take away as punishment, right? And a lot of people 
they're like, oh, no more treats for you because you know they're giving they're they're treating a dog who's already overweight, who's already been fed his breakfast, and they're expecting the dog to do this that for obedience, and they they're like, okay, fine, you know, no more training for you, and the dog's like, finally, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> you finally stop shoving those stinky treats down my mouth, you know, like we it, it also goes both ways because on the same side of reinforcement is the other end of that stick is punishment. And if you can't you if it's not a good reinforcer, it's also not good, a good punisher yeah. when it's removed. Yeah. When, when is a reward rewarding and when is a punisher punishing? Right. It's yeah. again, it's up to the dog to decide that. And if it's you can't a, read the dog, if you can't read the uh, dog, you're gonna you're wasting your time and you're wasting the dog's time and the dog's probably sitting there rolling his eyes thinking geez when are we going to be done training right and yeah the dog is certainly back to the question this dog is certainly not finding their advantage in those training sessions you know those 15 minute sessions the dog has found zero advantage in living his life like that yeah because maybe that dog wants to train for two hours and is capable of it yeah. Right. Whereas like uh, there was a dog um, I was training the other day. He was like, no, two minutes is it. <laughs> I don't want to do more than that. And if you continue, that's the thing. Now it starts becoming punishing to right. the dog. But uh, let me throw this is why dog training dog. On one hand, dog training is very simple. Like it's very, very basic there. You know, it's not not a lot to it. But on the other hand, it's like super complicated because it's it's understanding what is right for that dog in front of you and some dogs they're good at playing their owners for a fool right they know how to make make it look like the dog is done they start showing disinterest they start start showing that they that they flatten out and it's like okay buddy we've been at this for two minutes i know you've got more in your gas tank right and so holding them accountable through the right way right the answer helping them find their advantage you can really turn a lot of dogs around and you know the the answer to the question that you said you know bart brought up is you know why does a dog do anything in its life and the answer to better its own situation but you in order to better its own situation you have to understand the dog yeah and that's where i mean we have the learning pyramids for that also um besides understanding the dog is the learning pyramids that we use for training in Naval Pro. Yep. From the, uh, we have the three learning pyramids and which is the Popo learning pyramid, the Napo learning pyramid and the Napo Po learning pyramid. Uh, yeah. And the Popo, somebody asked me and I thought about it before. I was like, why is it Popo and not Po, right? And I was, I thought about it. I'm like, oh, Bart likes rhythm, right? The double click. You yeah. have the double click, so it's a double po. Uh, that's I, I've never asked Bart that, but I that's what uh, I think uh, he has said before. He likes rhythm, so right. <laughs> um, Maybe but along with the learning pyramids is the other side of that, where we have the aversive stim, right? The corrections and and aversive stim, which are two different things. Correction versus aversive. Uh, correction and aversive stem, two different things. And for those who don't know, um, I mean, if, if you're coming from a more formalized like dog training background where you've learned positive, the, the quadrants, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, negative punishment, POPO is closely aligned with the positive reinforcement quadrant, right? It's the addition of good things to the dog. The, good, the addition of toys, play, praise, food, treats, things like that. Um, NAPO is aligned with the negative reinforcement. It's the, it's the presence of something mildly un unpleasant or uncomfortable. And then the removal of that stimulus, which becomes a positive experience, right? Makes you feel good. You know, if, if you're, if your hand is, if you're sitting on a hot bench and then you stand up, it feels good that you got off the hot bench and you were reinforced for getting off the hot bench. So, so NAPO aligns with that negative reinforcement pyramid. I think the, the thing people forget, and that's powerful, is like in the NAPO, right? Is that when you're neutral, 
right? You don't feel good. You don't feel bad. You're neutral. Yeah. Now you add that mild discomfort. And then when you relieve the mild discomfort, you're back to neutral, but you feel better than you did before. Right. Removing the mild discomfort is actually more like you can say reinforcement saying or more positive than where you were before. And the genius thing about it is that you didn't have to produce something. Uh, there was nothing additive to the equation. It's a zero sum game in NAPO, right? So it's the, the supply is limitless. There's, there's always opportunity to be used for reinforcement, right? Because it's, it's of endless supply, at least until you get maybe to a point where like, you know, well, we won't go that, we won't talk about that, but like, it's always available. It's readily available. I always want to feel comfortable, right? You, you limit my, my comfort by putting me in a warm room or a cold room or, you know, something that doesn't feel so comfortable sitting on a hard bench, a bleacher, you know, I'm going to want to get off that to find my advantage through comfort, right? A lot of people call negative reinforcement, the comfort drive zone, right? Where you're trying to tack, tap into the comfort levels being the motivation behind the action. And talking about, um, I remember like, because I I don't I don't have a cold plunge, but I do like the cold shower. Yeah. Right? But and what I do is I stand back, let the water get cold. While I'm standing back, because of, you know right now it's cold outside, I start getting kind of chill, not under the water, just from the air. Then I you know I set my timer, I go under the cold water. And because it's so cold and it's uncomfortable, when I get out of that cold water, when I finally turn it off, even though I'm still in the same air I was before, feels where warmer. I was chill, now I feel good because that discomfort stopped. Yeah. Right? So I'm back to where I was before, but I feel better than I did uh, before go getting under that, that uncomfortable cold water. It's the same thing that drives people to the gym for to sit in the hot sauna. Like you sit there sweating your brains out and it's like, oh my gosh, like I'm sweating, sweating from my eyeballs, but like people sit there and then they go and they get out of the sauna and it feels amazing. Or they jump into the cold plunge and it feels amazing. Or they, they work out to the point where their muscles are like burning, they're aching, but after the workout, it feels amazing, right? They have that rush of endorphins the adrenaline, the neurotransmitters, and it feels good because they put pressure on their body that didn't feel good. The subsequent result was a feel good experience. Yeah. And, and that's about, that's about as napopo as, as possible because it's not that napopo is just like another name for training within the quadrant. It's the, the thing that separates napopo from everyone else who trains in the quadrant is that Napopo dictates the specific quadrants to use in which order to use them in for the, yeah. for the outcome of always on cue with heart and soul. That's the thing that people don't understand about Napopo is that the order of operations, like the quadrants have always been around. That's true. There's, there's a lot of criticism about, about it saying, oh, well, the quadrants been around longer than Napopo. Yeah, that's true. But the order in which those operations are being utilized, which quadrants are being used first and sub sequentially, that hasn't and, been- And the combination of them. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying is the combination of, okay. and the order in which you yeah. progress through that, that process, that wasn't around until Napopo. And that's what locks in the results of always on cue with heart and soul. Yeah. And that's why like in Napopo is also, it's a, they say to become the architect of your own system, right? Don't be closed in in a box saying this is the only way to do things. Know everything and then design your thing. And system is not the same for every dog, right? Design the system for this particular dog that's going to make it, again, do always on cue with heart and soul. Right. Because every dog is different and every dog needs to be trained differently. And for people who are new hearing that, what Mike just said, an example is 
take, for example, you know, an elderly person or someone who's maybe undergone, maybe they're injured somehow, maybe they sprain their ankle and they've got a very strong dog or they're unable to live with the dog. And rather than submit that dog back to a shelter, um, to a rescue or rehome it to somewhere else where it might not thrive as, as well, train the dog for a specific outcome, right? Create more stability in the dog who is otherwise too dominant or too, too energetic for the owner and allow the owner to live with that dog for the duration of its lifetime. That's the best outcome, right? Giving mm -hmm. that dog and that owner, assuming, and again, we're not talking about fringe scenarios where, you know, it's a mismatch, but like you can take an otherwise slightly or more energetic dog and help that dog through proper training fit into the lifestyle of someone who maybe is not as active as that dog would like, but that dog can still thrive with them if their needs are still being met and they're a good home for that dog. Yes. And then also it doesn't mean you're, the dog is never going to be able to express its energy. Right. Right. But that's where it comes in where it's on cue, right? Where you can teach the dog. Okay. We're going to teach you when you can express your energy, when you can run around like crazy, but at the same time, when you're going to, you know, be good and quiet and not jump on everything and not be, you know, pushy, uh, which one of the things in Naples Ho is about creating those pushy dogs, right? But right. the opposite end, being able to not create those pushy dogs to make it the other side of the coin. And vice versa. If you need to bring a dog up, right? Maybe a dog needs a job or, or has a job and they need to do it a little bit better or you know, be a little bit more flashy or you take a sport dog and they need to be more peppy, you know, have better attitude, then absolutely you can still train for that. But then uh, going back to the question about modern dog training, right? Yeah, fine. We have the positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, all those, uh, you know, learning pyramids, the popo, napo, napopo. Um, but there's times when you have to add the you must Yep. And Mark says you and Michael say you the must you must key, right? I think people forget that. Um I saw I saw what did somebody say? Oh, it's the the whole thing with David Poe is adding that where you must do this when I ask you to, right? But at the same time, the dog wants to do it and knows how to do it and looks happy doing it. The I don't know if I want to get into that. I'll, I'll leave that right now. <laughs> well, can we just let's 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 just talk about it for a second because because must do is super important for pets. It, it, it's absolutely something that a dog must understand. And people, like you said, this could go off into the weeds a little bit, but there are a lot of people who believe that dogs have free will, right, or should be allowed the expression of free will, right? Um, or or have their agency or whatever it is. It's it's very philosophical, kind of out, uh, kind of ridiculous. But at the same time, it's like okay, well, yeah, dog should be a dog. You should allow your dog to to express their their doggy drives. Let them go to the park, run free if it's safe, and you know there's there's appropriate you know controls in place so that you're not a risk to the dog, yourself, or your surroundings. Absolutely. But it's in the times where we've brought dogs, you know, into a human environment, we, we're not going out and living with wild dogs here, like they live in a human environment. If they can't be under control and told what to do from the people in the environment, then they're a risk to themselves or to others, and are incompatible with human life and human environments, urban living, right? And so... Yes. That's why that's why the must do button is important. It's not that we want robots twenty four seven from our dogs. We're gonna let our dogs be dogs as much as as we realistically can. But without a dog who's trained, you cannot have a safe or a reliable dog. And when the dog is not safe or reliable, there's no way you can legally or responsibly allow that dog to be free because they would be risky to the to the to, to society, right? Yeah. And that's where Naval Poe and modern dog training comes in, is um, where someone said that I, I don't have to use tools, I just choose to use them, right? 
Someone said that. But the problem is this, you cannot add the you must key without tools. You can't do it with just positive reinforcement, right? You because have it, to use tools it, if you want to add the you must key. Yeah, because the, the, that, that quadrant that they're playing in is not a, does not have an immediacy of action requirement attached to it, right? Positive reinforcement influences the future behavior. It doesn't influence the present behavior. The negative reinforcement, yeah. getting away from something that's uncomfortable or unpleasant is an immediately, it, it's an immediate, um, it creates an immediate response. Yeah. But the, the argument could be said that you could use, you know, with positive reinforcement, you have negative punishment, right? What is the correction of positive reinforcement or COPAL is, you know, negative punishment. Yep. Um, but I don't, that is not as strong, although we talk about it in using existential food. We talked about that first of all, right? Existential food can be that strong, but it's like you said, it's not immediate. It's not, and you only get one shot in a given window of time, right? If you take the food away for the dog failing to do something, you can't present it back five minutes later and say, oh, because then it breaks the dog's trust that that was the one time he had to, to make the right decision. Yeah, and I even that, I don't think with, with negative punishment, I don't think it's as much as causing avoidance to a behavior as it is teaching the dog to choose another behavior. That's a very good point. Right, because negative punishment, it takes away what the dog wants. And I think what that teaches is just don't choose that behavior, choose this other one if you want that reward. Yeah. Right, whereas when you use tools for negative reinforcement, positive punishment, now you're telling the dog that behavior is off the table. And that's the difference, that's the you must key. Exactly. That's why tools are important. Because they're, they're seeking to resolve that in that instance, because the consequence of their action is um, it, they don't want to experience it going forward and it must be resolved immediately. I don't think people are like, you should say this one more time. Say what you just said one more time, because I don't think pe like even people who are seasoned dog trainers might hear that and it might just go right over their heads. With negative punishment being where you're teaching the dog, negative punishment teaches the dog that to choose a separate behavior, yeah. the one that you're trying to get them to choose, but it doesn't really teach them to avoid that the first behavior, right? Right. That the, you must do this. Right. Whereas the tools, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, using tools for that, which you have to, that teaches one, the immediacy, like you must do it right now. And the dogs want to avoid that in the future. It paints the behavior as completely off limits. It's very clear to the dog what behavior is off limits and which one is not. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so much more clear to the dog. Yes. Right? Yeah, very strong. And it takes fewer repetitions. Again, the negative, the, the removal of something for punishment takes multiple repetitions. I don't care if you're taking a toy away, if you're stopping stopping play, if you're stopping barking in the blind, like if you have yeah. to- but, it And also- repetitions. Yeah, and also punishment, right? People talk about aversive, right? An aversive mm -hmm. punishment. Negative punishment, in my opinion, like if you, if you take away food for negative punishment, it can become aversive, but it can take a while, right? Or if you look at that dog that's 50 pounds overweight, how long is it gonna be before that, that punishment, the negative punishment of removing food becomes aversive, right? Whereas a toy, removing the toy, again, in my opinion, I, I don't think that's aversive. Yeah. Right, it's not aversive in the same sense as something the dog um, really wants to avoid in the future. It's just that going back to that, they're just they just choose a different behavior to get that that well, toy back. I think here. I mean, I'm, I I want to look up the word. I, I mean, aversive. I think. I mean, the way I understand it 
is it, it shares the same roots as avoidance, right? Aversive avoidance. Um, and I don't think the removal of something. Yeah. So the definition from de from from Webster's is tending to avoid or causing avoidance of a punishing stimulus. Right. Yeah. And I, I don't think negative, negative punishment. It doesn't create the aversion to a stimulus. Yeah. And because of that that behavior is not necessarily attached to that. Yeah. And that's why we have aversive stim in navel code, right? And why does the dog do anything to better its own situation? How does a dog better its own situation? It's the three learning pyramids, popo, napo, napopo, and the correction and aversive stim. An aversive stim is different than a correction because a correction makes a dog do something specific, whereas aversive stops a dog, dog from doing something specific. Yeah. And there are training methods out there that say punishment is strictly aversive. And they they will, that, that's one of the things they'll lob over the fence at the Napopo community is like, hey, you can't have mild or low level punishment involved in positive punishment. They argue the definition, but here's the thing. If it works and it works well, which thousands and thousands of dogs trained in the Napopo system prove that, why would you only want, like if, if you were, if you heard that you had more ways to use punishment to be effective instead of just strictly holding on to the traditional understanding that punishment has to be primarily aversive to be effective wouldn't yeah. you want more tools in your toolkit to be able to address problem problematic behaviors yeah and that's why we have correction slash punishment a correction slash punishment right and then again aversive because aversive is that high level right you know but the correction slash punishment is it's pushing the dog into something it already wants to do, right? And that's why- or, no, or knows to do. Yes, it knows to do, it has to know how to do it, has to understand what you're asking. But because of Naples Po, we've already, the dog already wants to do it. Right. So our correction slash punishment is pushing the dog into a behavior that it understands and wants to do. So it's not necessarily where you have to use very high discomfort to do that, right? Whereas if you, a dog that really wants to dig and you want to stop that, you have to use that high aversive to right. stop that because it really wants to do it. Whereas a correction size punishment comes when the dog is just being disobedient and We've already put in the reps where it really wants to do the down, for example, but for some reason it's paying attention to something else. It's motivated by something else in that moment. And when you add the correction slash punishment, it goes, oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to down, right? That's not as motivating as what we're doing now. Right. I just see a lot of benefit in having more tools available and Again, you know, people are going to hold on to their own definitions and that's fine. But if you can prove that it works and again, thousands, like I said, hundreds and thousands of dogs have proven that it is effective as a training system. Like, again, who are we to tell, tell the dog, like what, what works? Like, dogs are, dogs are not going to lie how, about how they've been trained. If the dog looks good doing it yeah. and the system that it was used to train it with was, was a good system. And if you can repeat that with many dogs, it's a great system. Yeah, and uh, that's what Bart always said, right? Yep. If, if your dog performs always on cue with heart and soul, then you're doing something right. Whether you train with food only, whether you train with toys only, whether you train with whatever, right? But at the same time, like you said, why throw out one of your tools? Why not keep them all available and then use the one that's better in that situation. Yeah.
I think a lot of people like to, I mean, we, we see this so much today with our influencer culture on social media, right? Everyone likes to, they like to be a fan of something. They also like to be a hater of something. It's, it's easy to get people to hate. And speaking of hate, for those that are watching this podcast, go and leave us a comment. Do you guys hate this stuff? Do you like it? Like, let us know. Tell us, tell us what's going well, what, what's learning, what stands out, what's, uh, what is maybe bringing some new thoughts and ideas to you and your, your dog training journey. Uh, we'd love to hear about it. We've had a few comments that have been amazing. Uh, we want to keep those comments coming. Um, so please do uh, engage with our, our comments, whether that's on social media, on the YouTube channel, um, or the individual yeah. videos. Uh, do do yeah. do, do keep it coming. Like we'd like to discuss with anybody about anything we said, right? Um, don't just take it back to your group. If you if you don't uh, agree with what we say, don't just take it back to your group and you know talk about you know your your about it with people you already you know discuss things with. Let's discuss it together. Right. Or make a comment and then let us uh, growth. clarify what you said. Yeah. And growth happens outside of the comfort zone, right? Yep. I mean, th that brings us to the next aspect of training within Napo Po is um, there are two roads that get you to the end destination. We we say two roads to Rome or many roads to Rome. But, but in general, when you categorize it, there are two ways to get to Rome in dog training. One is through the Pavlovian model classical conditioning or through operant conditioning the skinnerian behavioral um, model of training also known as instrumental conditioning and there there are those two roads that allow you to train dogs that's how learning or conditioning takes place for acquisition of new behaviors are through yeah. those two models um, but the the thing i learned from neighbor po is that those aren't a split Right, they're two paths, but they're not a split. They are going side by side. Yeah, and they are converging at times. Right, they're overlapping. They're yeah, not. There's, there's a lot. It's hybrid. Separate. It's hybrid because they're they not in separate directions. They depend on each other to to work. You know, I mean, because again, like just an example, you utilize classical conditioning and operant conditioning because in order for operant conditioning to take place, there must be a a terminal release marker that indicates a reward is being delivered for a specific behavior, right? A specific spontaneous behavior. But in order to charge or to load that marker, you must travel the path of classical conditioning and the pairing of cues. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then once you've acquired a behavior in operant conditioning and it's shaped and it's reliable and it's repeatable, then you need to name that behavior. And now you've gone back from operant conditioning into classical conditioning because you're now again naming and pairing a cue with a with an existing. Yeah, cue. because it all comes down to they're making associations, right? Associations with anything, with what you just did to something nice, or what you just did to something not nice. Um, it, it's all just intertwined. And I think. What uh, is I was thinking about this today, and uh, people say you can't teach with punishment, right? But actually, if you apply punishment correctly, the dog is learning something. They're learning what not to do. <laughs> Correct. So you are teaching with punishment, yep. right? Just like you're teaching with positive reinforcement. Uh, and when I say punishment, like in the four quadrants, um, you are teaching something. The dog is learning something, whether it's going towards something good or moving away from something bad. Yeah. The dog that counter serves. If he never has a bad experience trying to steal, steal a uh, ham sandwich off the counter, he's never learned that the ham sandwich is off limits. Correct. We talked about it before, the quadrants being so like confusing sometimes and i think that confusion comes from people trying to decide what quadrant something is in right besides the definitions by the time they realize what quadrant they're in or thinking about the the moment for teaching the dog is long gone right yeah and but and that plus 
they're they're intertwined, right? There's it's happening at the same time, right? Things are happening. That's why I like where we say correction and punishment, because it's stopping disobedience, so like punishment. You're stopping disobedience, right? The definition of punishment is stop behavior, right? Or make it less likely to happen. But at the same time, you're making a behavior happen. So if you're using, say, the leash with pressure, that pressure is punishing to the dog because you're punishing the disobedience. But at the same time, it's negative reinforcement into whatever you ask the dog to do, negative, like sit down, whatever. So with the same, if you're like in the maple post system where you give a tap, if the dog, you say sit and the dog doesn't sit and you're at the point where you give a tap as a correction. That one single tap is both a punishment in the quadrants. It's a positive punishment and negative reinforcement at the same time because it's one tap only and it does two things. Stops the bullshit, causes the sit down. Yep. And that's important because it allows us to, I mean, by using correction, punishment, aversives, it allows us to justify like the humane life that we would provide a dog, right? Because at the end of the day, <clears throat> there are just some training methodologies that, you know, are not fair to the dog. Um, and at, everything we care about falls under the umbrella of animal welfare law. Yeah, that's the one big thing that is taught you know in the in the schools is knowing the animal welfare law right? do you want to give us the yeah the so actual definition or whatever yeah so a little bit about that the animal welfare law was legislation that originated in europe it began as a result of the Karen Pryor book, Don't Shoot the Dog, a very controversial topic, a, a very charged title of a, of, a, of a book. And essentially that was used as the propaganda to push the European animal welfare law, which states that it is forbidden to inflict pain or suffering onto an animal without valid reason. And yeah. The question that immediately follows that clause is what is valid reason? Valid reason is anything that is deemed to save the life of a dog or prevent harm or injury to a dog or to prevent death or injury to a human. So as long as you're working within those boundaries, then you are justified in the use of infliction, inflicting pain discomfort, discomfort pain. yeah discomfort or pain to to keep a dog or a human safe right most people stop at that and be like okay yeah if a dog is biting somebody i can inflict you know pain to stop that biting stop to save the human right right, right. or if the dog is um about to jump out a window or off a ledge i can grab its tail or leg which may cause pain to the dog right or injury even right to save the dog's life right because if it does go over that ledge most likely it's going to kill itself right or if it runs in the street it hits by gets hit by a car mm -hmm. um but if you can do that to prevent it from happening in the moment why can't you use that discomfort to teach the dog not to do it in the first place right not to bite the person. So you preemptively add that discomfort so yeah. that that thing never happens. It never runs out in the street and gets hit by a bus. It never jumps off a ledge. It never bites a person. Right? Legally, a legally, it can That's be argued. Thing, right? Yeah, legally, it can be argued that if it's forbidden to use pain or to inflict pain on an animal, except to save its life or the life of a human, then you must inflict pain 
to save the life of a human or the life of a of an animal or a pet right it's it's the same side or, or a different side of the same coin it's just looking at it from a different angle correct and and given that definition we're enabled to use discomfort in training to prevent the potential for injury or harm to other animals or to other people through training yeah and that's and the use that's the thing we're talking more about and that used correctly right sure which um is the the whole point of of training and right especially oh is using the correct tools the correct uh methodology for that particular dog and what so where so you have i think bart says so you you'll get to a point where you have harmony so tell me you you shared this this article with me from a study that was put out there about the psychological effects of electric shock was what, what was that you, you said it, it was or, it was electric shock but it was also um well, let me see yeah i think that that's I got it from, uh, to talk about here so i got this from um uh, i follow, follow gary wilt um very he's got a lot of things that i'm interested in that he says um and he posted this where and i'm just going to read it word for word where it says yeah. <clears throat> dr ron van hooten quote one possible side effect of punishment is the production of emotional reactions several researchers have demonstrated that punishment with electric shock does not produce lasting emotional results and it has Hearst 1965, Hunt and Brady 1955. Uh, furthermore, where he goes, as Azrin and Holtz 1966 have pointed out, gross observation seems to indicate that no chronic emotional maladjustment is endangered by a child's having been burned by touching a radiator or having skinned a knee by falling off a bike. It is fortunate that punishment does not produce strong lasting emotional effects under most circumstances, since it would be impossible to eliminate punishment from the natural, natural environment. Although it is true that emotional behaviors are frequently observed following punishment, and this is important, it is also true that these effects are usually short lived, right? And going to like all the people, you know, on certain sides of the training you know spectrum they want to say that there's scientific evidence that punishment doesn't work but i think they ignore the scientific evidence that says it does work and also that it does not have an emotional effect that's long lasting right? i mean and i've touched a hot stove before when i was little and i'm not nervous about cooking around a hot stove now as an adult yep i'm my brother he he put his hand on a um toaster back in the day when we were young that burned his hand we had to go to the emergency room but he still, still makes, makes toast. Toast. He, he probably <laughs> makes a toasted sandwich every once in a while still and there's you know there's hundreds thousands of examples of that where we're not living you know i I broke my, my dog broke my leg, talking about pain, right? She broke my leg. I cannot remember how bad that hurt. Yeah. I know that I want to avoid another dog running into my leg. But every time I see a dog running at me, I, I don't feel the pain of my dog running into my leg. Right. Right. I'm just like, I'm careful now. It makes me avoid what I did before to have that happen. But I still train dogs. I still have dogs running at me. Mm -hmm. you know, it's it's not um, the effect. The long lasting effect is learning, teaching. Yeah, you're wiser because of the experience. Yeah, yeah. I hope that will help some people. 
you know, um, yeah, think of things is... in a different way. Yeah, and again, think about Napopo, thinking about modern dog training, thinking about the the quadrant. It's important to to be able to the use of tools. The, the, yeah, the use of tools. It's important to be able to have a consistent understand or a, a consistent knowledge of definitions of the labels, so that we can have open conversation, share ideas, open dialogue. <clears throat> yeah. For the betterment it, of dogs and our our opportunity, yeah, we shouldn't be. We should learn from everybody, right? We should go and try to learn from everybody and see um, how that fits into our training style. You know how it fits into our training philosophy, um, and not demonize other people because of the way they train. Especially when their dog looks good because of the way they've trained. Yeah. And that was the key. Does your dog look good and does it always perform on cue? The only reason someone has to promote a training system as better than another is strictly for ego. It's, it's strictly for to stroke the ego but when someone else's system produces a dog that looks good and does things reliably well and precise, there's no, no one has claim over, over someone's ability to continue to, to train in that system. You know? Yep. It's, it's too bad that there are too many, too many camps out there that are trying to like throw other camps under the bus, but it's, um, yeah, but you have you have people that show what they do and just they talk about what they do, right? But then you have other people that go, "I don't use food," or "I don't use a pinch collar," or "I don't use an e collar," making it seem like whoever does is wrong, right? But then it's they're caught wrong. doing they're doing it's actually doing the thing. So using food is right, but it's also wrong. Using pinch collar is right, but it's also wrong. Using e collar is right, but it's also wrong. Using a toy is right, but it's also wrong. What do I mean? It can be wrong for that particular dog. Right. And that's the key, right? Use with Napo Po, use whatever is motivating to that dog. And it's important. So you're not right or wrong if you use food, but you can be right and you can be wrong. Because that dog that's might that's that going to over a lot of people's heads. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we're here for. Yeah, that's the. It's like the dog. Uh, um, you didn't see that dog. Uh, his name is Blanton. He could care less about food, really. Right. So if I make him take food to do behaviors, that's going to be demotivating. Right. You know, even though I like using food, it's going to be demotivating. Now, can I change the motivation of that food? Yes, I can, because I learned that with Naval Pope. I can change it. But if I only have a limited time for something, I'm going to use the, the tool that is most effective for that dog right. in the shortest amount of time where it's still has the heart and soul right in its behaviors because you could that's the point right it's knowing um how to use those tools to keep that motivation high yeah and at the end of the day another nod back to the animal welfare law that matters so much to us as dog trainers and people involved in the dog industry is like there's already so much out there from the animal rights organizations that are being lobbed in our direction we want our dogs to look good we care about how they look we want them to be happy we want them to have healthy coats you know injury free long lives good homes it, it it matters right don't 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 bring your dog to training if your dog doesn't look good if it's underweight if it smells bad like do right by your dog overweight, overweight is also on that on that same token right like do right by your dog 
you know. The dogs are not they, a requirement for anybody to own. So don't own one if you can't give them the minimum of that, <laughs> right? Yeah, definitely. But also don't kill it with love, right? Don't prevent it I from see. learning, right? If you never let the dog learn, he just becomes a hooligan. Yeah, definitely. Like con. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's like a purposeful hooligan. You've created a <laughs> you've created a monster for a specific purpose. That's a different podcast, though. <laughs> that's a yeah, good title. Creating a monster for a specific purpose. I'm thinking we should name this podcast. Say something outrageous about modern dog training. I don't know. We'll, I think that's. Um, I think it's too long. Taking the too long. Shorter. <laughs> veto. I got vetoed by Michael. Um, the instead of say something outrageous about modern dog training, is there an adjective? Modern dog training is outrageous. <laughs> the outrageousness of modern dog training. Yeah. The I'll think it. I'll think it. So, something Maybe will come to me. If you're editing it, it'll something will come to you. Yeah, it, it usually does. So in in conclusion here, Mike, what uh what do you have going on that people should be aware of? What are you doing? What, what do you have coming up? Well, we have the Silver School in March. Yep. That we're going to. Um we hopefully I'll be coming up to you in a few months for some training. Yes. Yep. The October Gold School in bleep. I'll I'll black it out. I'll 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 bleep it out. <laughs> the October school in bleep. The joint joint October Gold School. Yes, the joint October Gold School. If you missed this in January in Vegas, you can catch us again in bleep. That's good. I think actually the lighting causes the my picture is better than it was other times. Right. Yeah. It's just, just have to... it's like look like you're in this like dark little basement office because it's you've got the little lamp on in the background and then it's just like yeah, yeah. I got that for like Pat if you look at Pat Stewart's stuff that's what he has like there's a light in the background and then there's a light from the front oh really and it whatever it does to the camera it's like I think it's just my glasses even though I have like the anti glare stuff uh huh. Um, I have to figure out, I have to put that, that camera closer to the wall. Cause right now it's more lit here. Okay. Yeah. I think if I put it there facing the wall, the reflection will bring like more even light. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool, man. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Good job. All right. Yeah. Nice. That was fun. We'll see you. Peace. Bye.